<laughs> it feels like your work is the linchpin in so much of what so many people are working on. And it's so exciting that you've gone through, I mean, this trilogy, and I know you're coming out with more, but so far this trilogy, this dirt erosion of civilizations, the hidden half of nature and growing revolution really provides the history, the real nitty gritty of the problem, and then the science behind it, and then the solutions. Yeah, you know, it's been a fun journey. Uh, when I started working on dirt, I was really not envisioning a trilogy, let alone a trilogy that I'd collaborate with my wife on. I mean, I was writing a book on you know, the role of soil land degradation on ancient civilizations, in part because you know, archaeology is super cool. I'm a geologist, and oh, it was I could learn some archaeology, look at those connections, and I'd been fascinated with the effect of erosion on human societies literally since college, because I, I read a book from the 1950s called Topsoil and Civilization. Dirt was my effort to update that book, because uh, you know, because the idea that land degradation has impacted ancient societies, it's not a completely original idea. Other people have written about this before, and I wanted to update that, because we know a lot more today than we did in the past. It's one of the nice things about research is you can keep building on stuff that we knew. Um, and I got carried away. Um, it turned out really to be a lot of fun, a lot of interesting stuff. And by the end, I'd written a history of farming. And that wasn't what I thought I was doing when I started it, but that's what the story was. And that got me really interested in the way, how the way we farm affects the fertility of the land and how that in turn affects the productivity and longevity of civilizations. And then Sort of kept going from there with, um, uh, after writing Dirt, well, quite literally when I was finishing Dirt, we bought a house in North Seattle. Uh, Anne Beclay, my wife, and I bought a house in North Seattle. And she's a gardener. I mean, she, she has the green thumb. I have a brown thumb. I'm not even allowed to have office plants anymore, right? Because apparently you need to water them. Um, and this is, um, so I'm much more geologically inclined. I probably ended up in the right field. Anne's a biologist. She's a gardener. She's a, a wonderful gardener. She wanted to have a garden at the house that we bought. And we realized after we bought the house that we had terrible soil. Uh, we had sort of what's fairly typical for parts of North Seattle, glacial till, where the organic matter got stripped off when they built the house. It was really wretched soil. Um, we stripped off a lawn to plant a garden. There were not no worms beneath the lawn. It, it looked like beach sand, khaki-colored fragments of rock. We had the geology. We didn't have the biology. So Ann started fixing our soil uh, through adding organic matter, composting and mulching, and really started taking care of and investing in the land, trying to rebuild its organic matter. And how fast that happened, you know, literally blew me away. Because I was looking back at history about how it's, you know, slowly societies sapped the fertility and viability of their land. And here Ann was like restoring ours literally overnight, geologically. You know, over the course of a few years, we started to see really big changes. And I started to realize, as did she, that soil restoration was not only feasible, it was feasible quite rapidly. It could be done quickly. And the issue wasn't breaking rocks down to make new soil, the way I'd been trained to think about as a geologist. You know, because it takes a long time to turn a rock into dirt. You, know, you can take a, a, a hunk of granite, go set it on a sidewalk somewhere, and how long is it going to take before it breaks down into soil? It's going to be a while. Um, but if you already have the mineral matter broken up, you can add the life really fast. You can add the biology back. And what makes soils really fertile is that combination of geology and biology. You need the minerals, but you also need the biology to unlock the minerals, get them out, and deliver them into the world of life. Get them into the biological circulation that through generations have made our chemistry different from the chemistry of rocks. Um, so her sort of experience in our yard opened, opened our eyes to that. We wrote about that in The Hidden Half of Nature, where sort of the world of microbes came alive to us because we, we'd been trained in the, the larger sort of scale natural sciences. The microbial world was kind of a new foray for us. And it turns out they run an awful lot of the show. Um, and they impact soil fertility greatly. And, and, and there's parallels with what goes on in the human gut that we, that we might get into. But, you know, seeing how fast life came back to our yard and how fast we could put carbon in the soil, how fast we restored fertility to the land and what that did to all the plants on our lot, giving us sort of the verdant garden that we have today that she shepherded through the process.
really made us ask the question of, well, could you do the same kind of thing on farms? Could you use soil rebuilding practices of regenerative agriculture to actually rebuild the fertility of farmland soils around the world, sort of fixing the problem that I wrote about in the dirt book. And that's what we wrote about in the um, Growing a Revolution, where we visited farmers around the world who had restored fertility to their land. Um, and why did we go to them? Well, because they had already done the thing that we were hypothesizing could be done. And if something has been done, it's possible to do it and to do it again. So I wanted to ask questions like, well, what were their methods? Could this work at scale? Could it work on small-scale subsistence farms? And what were the sort of the commonalities between farmers around the world that had already restorative fertility to their land? What was the recipe, if you will, for fixing the ancient problem of land degradation, soil erosion? And was it practical to think about doing that at a global scale? And I'm, I'm happy to say that I've gone from being something of a pessimist back when I was writing dirt, because it's, it's a sad story when you look at what people have done to land around the world. And I've become much more of a, of a genuine optimist that we can solve the land degradation problem. And why? Well, because I've seen people do it. I mean, I know it's feasible. The question is whether we will do it at scale. And, and there's issues of how we would do it, what are the right methods in different areas. There's no sort of magic bullet. But there's a different way of thinking about it that can lead us to methods and techniques that do seem to work pretty well and that can be tailored and adapted to different areas around the world. <laughs> What's so remarkable in one of your talks, you talk about how in all those areas where the prime degradation is happening in the red and the yellow zones on that map you were talking about in this wonderful talk that you had, those areas have regenerative examples in them. Yeah. And so the yeah. experts are almost like they're already in place and we just have to bring the recognition like through your work to them. Yeah. I mean, that, that is one of the really sort of, uh, you know, real legitimate causes for optimism is that you can go into many of the world's sort of degraded agricultural landscapes and find the farmers who have figured out how to turn it around. A lot of them tend to be not, they don't sort of tend to advertise what they're doing. Uh, they just have done it and figured it out. Um, there's some there's lessons all around the world that that we could learn and clone to take advantage of the expertise that people have developed. And a lot of the farmers who've done that may not sort of understand all the details of what's gone on in their soil. In fact, probably most soil scientists wouldn't understand all the details of what's going on in the soil. There's a lot remaining to be discovered. Um, but there's practical experience that's built up, and there's now enough of sort of an understanding of sort of a different way to think about the soil um, and to organize those observations that it can give us sort of ways to take those examples, think about how to generalize them, and move forward to try to um, spread the adoption of regenerative agricultural practices. It's actually a really exciting time to be thinking about agriculture because we're at what I like to think of as the cusp of the next agricultural revolution. Um, I think I called it the fifth revolution and growing revolution. And that's why the title of the books is that way. I think we're sort of at the point where we can legitimately talk about what could be termed a soil health revolution in thinking about what are agricultural practices that build the health and the fertility of the land while producing intensive amounts of food, enough food to, to feed the world. Um, that's the real challenge. Um, the other challenge, of course, is to make that food nutritious and to not only feed but nourish the world. Um, and there's really good examples of people we can learn from out there in the farming world. As a history teacher, I was really shocked at how little I really understood about the main events in our history and how the underlying causes almost always had to do with soil. Yeah, I mean, this is the part of both American and world history that I never learned in, in uh, high school or in college. I learned it mostly researching dirt and putting that story together. And yet if you look at sort of what it is that is a theme that you're able to sort of draw through the, the sort of success of societies around the world and their ultimate demise, you can quite legitimately argue that the stage that all set was played out on was set essentially by the condition of the soil. So if you have like a small society with a lot of really fertile land, that's a recipe for growth. Uh, and if you then have a very large society with very degraded land, it's a recipe for instability, uh, for non-resilience, if you will. And so you could look for you know, classical Greece, uh, the Romans, uh, the southern United States. They're all examples that we kind of learn about in history, but we don't learn about the environmental template that their sort of progression and development played out on. And to me, that was the real eye-opener of, of dirt, was that uh, 
you know, societies that take care of their land can thrive and prosper and last, and those that don't, don't last. Um, but the time scales involved are longer than our individual lives, which makes it, you know, it's kind of like infinity on the political spectrum, right? You know, it, it's well beyond the next uh, election. It may be, you know, beyond the next generation. But those small changes, as long as they're always in the same direction, can add up over time. So if we're, if we're literally, if you think about soil the way we, we all think about our bank accounts, where we have income and we have expenses and we have savings. And you think about the soil, um, it's essentially the resource that's like that for civilization because it sort of finances, if you will, with, with, um, with environmental capital, our ability to feed ourselves. And you have income in terms of building soil, and you have expenses in terms of eroding soil, and your savings are your standing stock of soil on a landscape. And if you, you know, if you spend money faster than you make it for long enough, you tend to run out of it. I've done this a few times. It, it actually works that way. <laughs> and civilizations, it turns out, have done that in terms of degrading their land to the point where it, can, it no longer robustly supports them. And they then become vulnerable to other kinds of disturbances, say a, a drought, um, an invasion from one's neighbors, um, economic collapse. There, there's different ways to essentially sort of pull the rug out from under a society. But if you look at the condition of the land, it's sort of the long wavelength periodicity where you're explaining rises and falls, and then individual climate shifts or wars or things are the high frequency noise that we hear about in history textbooks. But the context for those things, I think, is as important as the actual events. What set the stage for a drought being particularly catastrophic? And you know, and the American Dust Bowl is like the perfect example of that, right? Where the plowing up the plains really made the land vulnerable to the wind storms that swept the plains, where there'd been something like 13 comparable droughts in the preceding 2,000 years in the plains without the kind of erosion that happened once we plowed, plowed the land up. The way people treat the land kind of sets the stage for how those things play out. Um, and that's the part of history we haven't really been very good at teaching, in part because most people don't recognize it. Um, most historians are not trained in geology or soil science, they're trained in, in history, the things that people do, so we, that, that gets focused on. There's nothing wrong with that, but there's this other dimension of how people have interfaced with the landscape and how our choices and decisions shape the landscape and come back to influence us. So it's not just that, you know, there's certain places in the world where you should or shouldn't farm and, you know, and geography is destiny kind of a thing. It's more like the way people interact with the land sets up systems of of change and nutrient cycling and or erosion or soil building. And it's those kind of things that affect societies over the long run. So it's very integrated. What people do to the land affects how the land uh, affects those societies. It's not just sort of one way or the other. It's really the back and forth that is, is to me, the sort of the, the basic fabric of history. And that touches upon so many other disciplines uh, when we start seeing the social side of things. Uh, and yeah, people are the complex part of the problem. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, I imagine that if we, could, if we were trained in this lens in schools, that we would be able to recognize conflicts before they happened. We would be able to see that, that, that connection between the land and the people more readily. Something that occurred to me as we were talking, the, it, it really hurts in many ways reading dirt. Um, especially if you're like a farmer, especially if you've got a rototiller in, you know, in your shack or something. Go wait, I'm not supposed back. to do this. <laughs> right, right. But the, what's really important is the other half of the story, the growing revolution, because this is the opportunity for our farmers, our family members, our cousins, we're all related, yeah. to actually become the heroes of the story. Yeah, yeah. No, the thing that turned me into an optimist on soil rebuilding is that it looks like the kind of practices that you would do to restore fertility to the land or to put carbon in the ground um, are the kind of things that can actually help make farms more profitable. And so uh, one of the big themes in the Dirt Book is how often the short-term incentives for farmers don't line up with the, with the long-term needs of society for preserving the fertility of the land to feed future generations. And that has been a real problem, society after society. But we're starting to get to the point in Western agriculture where the cost of, of the inputs, the fertilizer, the diesel, the, the pesticide that farmers have come to rely on in our modern agricultural systems have gone up so much and they've been able to produce so much food that the commodity prices they get are really low because they're growing an awful lot of just a couple crops. 
so it depresses the price. Those two things work to basically squeeze the farmers in the middle because they spend more up front and they're not making as much for their harvests. Um, if you could actually figure out a way to reduce their input costs but maintain their harvests, it's a recipe for more profitable farms. And that's exactly what regenerative farming does, is by building up the soil organic matter, um, when, by restoring fertility to the land, restoring some of the biology that helps with nutrient cycling, when they're able to greatly reduce their fertilizer use. By going no-till as part of that system, they're able to reduce their diesel use because the tractors aren't driving so much. Um, you save at least one pass and sometimes a lot more. Uh, per year. So you're spending less on diesel, spending less on fertilizer, and if your crops are healthier, you're spending less on pesticides. Um, you put that all together, and if you're able to harvest the same, it's, much, it's more profitable. It's also better for the environment, and one of the other ancillary questions is whether or not it grows food that's better for us. And that's the book that Ann and I are working on now, where we're trying to sort of, you know, wrestle with that question and try and uh, ascertain, well, where's the data, Who, how, where are studies, we're collecting some data ourselves. Um, but it looks like there's a difference. And that, so there's all these kind of um, advantages or benefits, if you will, that can spring from restoring health and fertility to the land. But the, most, the one that makes me most immediately optimistic is it can be better for the farmers. I mean, and not just because they have a lower pesticide burden and better health outcomes and all that kind of stuff, uh, which is important. But at a fundamental economic level, that if it's more profitable, it's, it's likely to actually catch on. And that's kind of what we're seeing in terms of these, these um, practices. It's really exciting. I mean, people are finally updating, you know, the BRICS meter after, you know, what, 150 <laughs> years? We're, we're really digging into wanting to, well, prove that it's actually better than conventional. And, yeah. and now organic is, is kind of grown up. You know, we have regenerative organic agriculture showing up being like, well, now we can prove it, you know? Yeah, and there's, there's, you know, if you look at all the studies that look at organic versus conventional sort of foods, it's kind of a mixed bag in terms of the outcomes. And so it's why sort of every other year you hear this as the sort of a new volley in the intellectual ping pong match of, you know, is, is, is organic better or not than conventional? And if you get in and sort of read all those studies and try and parse them, some interesting things come out. Um, you almost always find big differences in the, the phytochemicals, the, the antioxidants, the polyphenols, sort of compounds that plants make in response to stimuli that really are different in organic and conventional systems. And, and those, as far as I can tell, those are fairly robust differences that come into play. Um, in terms of like the, the major elements in terms of minerals, there don't seem to be an awful lot of differences. Um, and in fact, you know, a lot of conventional foods are, have more nitrogen and more phosphorus in them for reasons that should be fairly obvious given how we fertilize our crops conventionally. But when you start looking at the mineral micronutrients, you start seeing sort of uh, some studies find more in organic, some studies find more in conventional. It almost depends on which nutrient and which study. And part of this may be that when you think about the difference between conventional and organic as just a simple lens, well, what are you really trying to get at when you look at how minerals get into the plants? If you're trying to look at soil health and you're trying to look at whether you know, the bacterial and fungal communities in the soil that may be facilitating that, there's organic farms that don't do too well by that measure in terms of building soil health. And there's conventional farms that really do really well at building soil health. The labels of organic and conventional, in other words, may not really cover what you need to be thinking about if you're trying to think about the mineral micronutrient transfers into the soil. In terms of the phytochemicals, that looks like a clearer story so far, at least in the research we've been digging into. But maybe the real story is the things that we should be doing on our farms that are building soil health in both conventional and in organic systems. And that may be how we could re reboost the, the mineral micronutrient content by putting all this bacteria and fungi back to work in the soil as the miners and truckers getting those mineral micronutrients out of the rock particles and the soil particles and, and into the biology, into the crops, where they can then become accessible to whether our, our livestock or ourselves. The, the part that has come to my attention that we sort of dug more into, looking at the role of glyphosate in the soils as a, um, as a mineral chelator and whether or not that's actually locking up mineral micronutrients and keeping them from getting into plants. And there seems to be some evidence that suggests that is happening and it's patented as a mineral chelator. Um, but there's also questions about what it does to the, the, 
uh, the microbiota in the soil. It's also patented as an antibiotic. Um, and what it does, if it gets into us in terms of our own microbiome um, in our gut. But those are all questions that we're going to be wrestling with to some degree in the new book because it's, you know, the question of whether how we grow our food impacts its healthfulness, if you will, to us is a pretty direct, you know, it's of direct, should be of direct interest to anybody who eats. And that's pretty much all of us. Yeah, I was listening to someone talk about like where are the mama bears in our society, and I think it's I think we're all just so um, shell shocked and confused to a certain degree that uh, people don't know what to believe because there hasn't been enough clarity. Yeah, it's one of the ironic things about the, sort of the age of the internet and sort of information overload is where do you get your information? What are credible sources? Um, that's the kind of stuff that Ann and I try and dig into in doing these books, is that we read, read widely. We don't work for anybody who's actually sort of has a financial interest in this. We're trying to figure out what the story is, and then make a good story out of it, because you don't want to like read a book that's boring, right? <laughs> um, but a big part of the job is trying to parse through um, information sources, and it's not just web stuff. I mean, you go into the scientific literature and journals, and there's major arguments back and forth about does this do that or not, and, and scientists set up different experiments and sometimes come up with very different answers on as to the same question. So you then have to go, well, what was different about their experiments? Is it that context is king and everything depends on that, which makes it hard to draw generalities? Or can you get into sort of what's behind um, some of the interpretations. Um, there was one study, for example, from a few years ago where people were looking at whether or not uh, no-till farming, sort of farming without plowing, um, so you're directly planting seeds through the remains of last year's crop stubble, whether that helped build up soil organic matter, soil carbon. And the, the motivation was thinking in terms of carbon sequestration. Um, but this, it, was one, it was a meta-study, so it was a study of studies. So people had compiled all the studies they could find where people had done no-till and measured soil carbon and tried to say, well, did it go up or did it go down? But they defined no-till so broadly, that they basically came up with an ambiguous answer, if I recall correctly. It was sometimes yes, sometimes no. But I read through that study, and then you, when you get into the body of it and you parse it, they, the authors of it basically acknowledge that, oh, well, when you had no-till practices with cover crops and with a diverse rotation of crops, so it wasn't just like corn on corn on corn on corn, or corn and soybeans and flipping back and forth, it was a, a much more diverse rotation. When you had those three elements, you always had big increases in soil carbon. So to me, the take-home message of the study wasn't the headline title, which was that no-till may or may not increase carbon sequestration. It was that no-till's not enough. What you need is this other system that has three components, which not coincidentally are the three that I wrote about in Growing a Revolution as the things that if farmers did them all together, if they ditched the plow, they covered up with cover crops, and they grew a diversity of crops, that they saw big changes in their soil health, their soil fertility allowed them to reduce their fertilizer use, their herbicide use, um, insecticide use. It's that, and so what is it about those three things together that might actually lead you to think they, they, you would expect to see boosts in soil health? Well, that's a recipe for cultivating the beneficial life in the soil. It's basically, if, you're, if you thought about it, well, how do you take care of, how do you cultivate, how do you steward the, the beneficial fungi and bacterial, bacteria in an agricultural soil? Well, you wouldn't disturb them. You'd feed them and you'd ensure they had a community to interact with. And so why the last one first? Well, because a community of organisms that are interacting is usually more resilient than a monoculture. How many monocultures are there in nature? There aren't any. They're not stable because they're easily perturbable. If you want to look at resilience as an ecosystem property, diversity is sort of near, near the top of the list. If you look at what it would take to feed soil life, you know, getting carbon into the system so there's more organic matter in the soil, that's kind of how to do it. It's the currency, the fuel that drives the, underground, the, the original underground economy. Um, and if you think about disturbance, you know, how long would you live in your house if once a year somebody came in, pulled the, the roof off, and stirred up all your stuff? Right? I mean, this is just like, you're not going to stand for it, you'd move. Might, you know, soil life is kind of similar. Um, you go through a plow, you know, you take a plow through a field, what do you think it's going to do to the worms? They're not going to be happy at being cut in half. Uh, 
Um, so you know, minimize disturbance, feed them, and provide a diverse community. That's a recipe for cultivating the beneficial life in the soil. And that can change remarkably fast. Um, so it's been said that all soils have all the micro, macro nutrients in them, and they're just locked up in the sand, silts, and clays. Um, what is your response to that? It's not, it's not true. Um, the, it's a, I think it's a, as a generality grossly over the surface of the earth, it's more or less kind of sort of true, but in literally it's not true. Because yeah. I mean, you, there are some soils that are like, you know, sands that are basically just quartz sands. It's got silicon and oxygen in it. <laughs> you know, you don't have the mineral micronutrients. But if you look at most agricultural soils in most parts of the world, yeah, the stuff that you need to grow plants is in there. The question is how you get it out of the soil particles. And you take a, a typical soil test, um, it's just testing what's plant, ava plant available, which means already soluble. Now, if you look at how something like, say, phosphorus gets out of a rock and gets into a plant, most of the phosphorus in the soil is tied up in stable minerals. They're, it's not very soluble. It takes a while to get it out, and there's fungal communities and bacteria that work to dissolve that stuff out of rocks, and that can really quite specifically go get it, and they will actually bring it back and trade it to plants for sugars. Why? Well, because the one thing fungi can't do, I mean, they're pretty amazing organisms, but they can't photosynthesize. They can't harvest sunlight and turn it into organic matter. They need a plant to do that, and then they can either um, eat, if you will, stuff that the plant pushes into the soil, that a plant exudes into the soil through its roots, or they can decay uh, organic matter, the once living matter that used to be a plant. Um, and what do plants do? Well, they have this ability to photosynthesize, and they're stuck in the ground. They, they have, the world they see is the world their roots can reach to. And so these partnerships developed between fungi and plants in particular, where the fungi are acting as root extensions for the plants, bringing some of the mineral micronutrients that the plant may not have access to because they're dispersed at low concentrations in the rocks in non-soluble forms. They can actually bring that and trade it to the plant for some sugar or from sort of some exudates, whether it's sugars, proteins, and lipids, you know, plants have been documented to push all three out of the roots, fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. What does that sound like? Food, right? I mean, they're feeding the microbes in the soil, and they're not doing that just to be nice. They're doing it because they're getting something in return. And they're trying to, and that could take several forms. They could be recruiting organisms to populate the zone around their roots that are benign, that do nothing for the plant in return, but take up space so pathogens can't have at their roots. That would actually be an advantage. It would be an even bigger advantage if they were feeding organisms that went out and, say, got phosphorus and brought it to the party and traded that for some sugar. And that's where the partnerships between, like, fungi and plants come into play. And, you know, ever since uh, Ann and I wrote The Hidden Half of Nature, we've been sort of following that literature as it develops. And the amount of work coming out on those kind of partnerships is astounding. And the, the sort of the additional wrinkles that keep getting added in terms of bacterial communities working with the fungi to get stuff out of the rocks, it's way more complicated than sort of our first blush look at it is. Um, but this whole idea of looking at the way that microorganisms partner with their host organisms, whether in the human gut or whether around the roots of a plant, is kind of a newish way of looking at nature. And that's why we called the book The Hidden Half of Nature, is there's, a, this found, there's sort of a foundational piece of nature that we don't tend to think about, but that's really important and we're only starting to understand. And if we really took what we already have learned about it, to heart in both agriculture and medicine. It's an argument for changing some of our conventional practices in both. And that's what the hidden half of nature is all about. So, so what, what would you recommend to like a farmer, this conventional farmer, he's interested, he's willing to do anything, but he really wants to make the change fast. What, what would be the first few steps that you would recommend? Well, well, I mean, that first one of being willing to try, I mean, that's huge. Because, uh, I mean, it's one of the biggest impediments to adopting new practices is our habits. I mean, whether that's our day-to-day -day habits or whether it's how we farm or even how we write research papers, we all have our habits. And being open to new ideas was one of the primary characteristics that I found in all the innovative farmers that I interviewed who had already 
figured out how to do very successful regenerative farming in their region, whether it was West Africa, Central America, or North America. They were curious, and they tinkered, and they experimented. They, want, they were open to change. So to me, that's just so that, you know, if, if someone's saying that they're willing to think about doing it and to try some stuff, that's the first step. And, it, um, you know, and that recipe of ditching the plow, covering up, and growing diversity, I mean, one can walk into that one piece at a time, or one can jump whole hog into it. And how one manages the transition from, say, a, a conventionally operated farm to a regeneratively operated one is important. Because if you just jump right into, say, growing corn on a field that's had nitrogen added to it, as synthetic nitrogen for 100 years, and you don't plant something in between to bring the nitrogen content back up or start building the organic matter content up, and you're planting a nitrogen-hungry crop, you're gonna fail. You're gonna have trouble, right? It's not. It's not dressing for success. So, the uh, I would recommend basically trying to find farmers in one's region who have already figured out how to apply these principles, and then you know lean on their expertise and knowledge to go. Well, which cover crops? You know, how should I sequence this? What should my first step be? But you want to get fairly soon to that full um, suite of no-till with cover crops and at least three or four crops in a rotation or in one's cover crops. Some of the farmers I visited got the diversity part in all in their, in their cover crops. They were growing wheat, corn, and soybeans. That's all they sold. But they grew incredibly diverse mixtures of cover crops. And that seemed to work pretty well. Um, so taking advantage of the expertise that's already in a region. There's no point in reinventing the wheel. Um, the farmers that I saw who, the, who had made this transition, many of them did it over the course of many years because they did do it one at a time. But they also all said that they could teach people how to do it in two or three years to do sort of a rapid transition. And there can be a yield penalty if you sort of start into it because if you're going to rely on, on a cycling of, of nutrients and organic matter um, to really replace a lot of a lot, if not all fertilizers, um, you need to build that up. So it can take, it can take a bit. Um, but a few years is not all that long in the big scheme of things. Societally, I think one of our big challenges is figuring out how to assist farmers through the transition and how to basically lower the risk profile for them to try something new that might, in the end, have great benefits for them personally and for their farm, but also for society as a whole. Because if there's one thing that we're going to need 100, 200, 500 years from now, we're going to need a healthy, fertile land to grow the food that it takes to feed humanity. And as we get to a 10 billion person planet, that's going to become more important and more urgent than ever. Um, so you know, we have kind of this century to figure out how to operationalize regenerative farming at a large scale. Because if we continue to rely on farming practices that degrade the land to feed ourselves, we're just going to write a new chapter in my dirt book. Hmm. I think that that's also another perspective that you re really bring to the table is um, People are, you know, headline grabbing with, we have 12 years left, you know. Um, right. But when you dig into those studies, there's no definite, like, anything like that in the actual studies. No, no. And, and, and we're not going to run out of soil, right? We're not going to run out of dirt. What we may do is basically change the ratio of how much healthy soil we have to how many people we have to a point where it becomes unstable and we get regional crises and food crises. That's all feasible. Um, but we're not going to literally run out of soil because, in part, farming will have to change and adapt as we burn. If we keep going on the, at the pace we're going, um, there's, there's reasonable forecasts that we could have serious problems by the end of this century in terms of our, the availability of fertile land and of soils. And we could burn through an awful lot more of the world's topsoil this century if we don't change. But I think we will change. And I think the impetus is, is starting, to sort of, it's starting to line up to favor change. And I'm quite excited and optimistic about it because, I mean, how many good news stories do you hear about the environment these days? Um, I think we actually could get the economics and the environment parts of the farming equation to line up if we think about the soil differently, if we think about the regenerative practices as sort of the new standard, if you will, mm -hmm. and if we think about how to apply them in both conventional and in organic systems without trying to make one into the other, how would you adapt them? Because uh, I started to tease some of the farm conventional farmers that I was interviewing for Growing Revolution who had adopted these regenerative practices. I started to tease them that they were organic-ish farmers because 
they were basically weaning themselves off of agrochemicals. But they were still, they were engaged in modern farming. They used high-tech equipment. I mean, some of them were low-tech in the developing world. Um, some of them were using like wildly space-aged high-tech uh, gear in North America. Um, but the challenge is really, I think, how do you marry that sort of modern technology and science and our understanding, our new understanding of the microbial connections, how do you marry that to some of the ancient wisdom of crop rotations, of, of, of a diversity of crops, of even bringing livestock and cropping into the same land, sort of reintegrating animal husbandry and farming? I'm not convinced you have to bring animals back onto farms to restore the soil because I've seen farms that restored their land beautifully without them. But I've also seen places where I think it's pretty clear that having livestock managed the right way, it greatly accelerated the transition. So there's lots of dimensions to the problem, but we have a legitimate opportunity this century to reconceive of how we farm at a global scale and not to go back to medieval farming, but to basically take what we know about modern science for which you know, there's elements of agriculture, agroforestry, of permaculture, of no-till. There's lots of things that can be combined. And I think the sort of the unifying lens, if you will, is what builds soil health. If farming practices make the soil more fertile and more healthy as a consequence of growing food, those are good. Ones that basically degrade the land as a consequence of growing food, those are bad. You know, it's that simple, kind of. Where if you think, if you're willing to think over a two, three hundred year time scale, that's the only way to think about it. Because if you have, if we're degrading the land that, it take, that we rely on to feed ourselves, it's just a question of time until we do get to some of those dire predictions. The, the, the ones that we're going to run out of soil in 12 years or 50 years, I don't put much credence into. But the problem is if we do continue at the pace we're going, we could get close to that. And you only have to get close to cause big problems. You don't have to take it all the way to the end. You know, in terms of how any individual can get involved with this, there's, it depends sort of what your context is. I mean, if you're a home gardener, you know, there's things you can do in your yard that are parallel to what farmers can do on their land and in terms of treating your soil differently. You can restore soil in a window box garden. You can do it on a lot like Ann did in our yard that we talk about in the hidden half of nature. You can do it on a whole farm. And the key is really cultivating the beneficial life in the soil. So don't disturb it, feed it, and cultivate a diversity of it. Those are the three sort of like uh, you know, overarching um, principles, if you will. Um, and be engaged. Think about where your food comes from. Um, and I've started to buy most of our food when, when we can from farmers that we know how they farm because of what we've unearthed in terms of the quality of food that comes out of regenerative farms, you know, looks good to us so far. Um, so knowing how, how the land was treated on the land that's growing your food, is kind of difficult today. You walk into a grocery store, there's not a lot of labels other than the organic conventional one. And at least with the organic one, you know that you're getting a lower pesticide burden. And that's pretty clear in all the studies, um, and it's important. Um, we need signals for consumers to be able to go, look, this farm that I'm buying this food from, I want to support them with my food dollars. Um, and I think that the ability to do that is coming. There's people thinking about it, people working on it. Um, maintaining political pressure for things like how to reform the food system, how to compensate farmers for increasing their soil organic matter, putting carbon in the ground. If we, as a society, if those of us who live in cities would pay farmers just a little bit more to actually do the right thing on their land. By then, by the right thing, I mean regenerate its fertility so future generations will have the same opportunity to eat the same diverse set of foods we have today. You know, I think that's a good investment in our future. Um, and I'm quite heartened to see much more societal discussion around this sort of coming to the fore. We have an opportunity to fix it. We can do it. The real question is, are we gonna? Sure, it's a pleasure to talk to you. Ha, ha, ha.